This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with author Brian Meeks, and we discuss mastering Amazon ads, self-publishing, and productivity hacks for authors. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Brian Meeks. Brian Meeks likes to tell a story. He is a US-based author who writes mysteries, thrillers, and science fiction, as well as non-fiction titles about the business of being an indie author. You'd never guess then that he hated writing until January 2nd, 2010. It was on that day that he wrote a blog piece, which attracted, within around 24 hours, a respectable 300 views and 25 positive comments. This provided the spark he needed, and since then, he's written over 1,500 blog posts, three fiction books, and 13 novels, including his successful Henry Wood Detective series. He also has a new book out with a former creative get, uh, podcast guest that we've had, Honoré Corda, which is called The Prosperous Writer's Guide to Making More Money, which is a great title. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Brian onto the show today. Welcome, Brian. Well, James, I am thrilled to be here. This is exciting. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, right now, I'm almost entirely consumed by a new project I'm working on. It's called Mastering Amazon Ads and Author's Guide. And about a month ago, I created a closed Facebook group to help with beta reading. And that group has expanded. Bloated. I'm up to 400 people now who are interested in learning how to do Amazon ads. And at present, I spend almost every waking moment helping people in the group. It's It's been quite, quite fun, though. It has actually slowed down the finishing of the book. But I've gotten many ideas that will make the book better. So it's a reasonable trade-off. And, and what, was the, what was the inception of the book? Where did the, the initial idea come from for that one? Well, I have to attribute nearly all of my financial success as an author to using Amazon ads. And back in, I believe it was October, Amazon opened up their ad platform to authors that were not exclusive with Amazon. As such, there was a flood of new people coming in that didn't know how to run them, didn't know how to make them profitable. And there's a lot of there's a fair amount of misinformation about the ways to scale with Amazon ads and so I sort of found myself answering a lot of questions on other Facebook groups and somebody said you should write a book and so I did and I mentioned that story. I mean, coming to writing relatively late in life, 2010, but I was reading the other day um, that you have a very unusual maybe background for for, uh, for an author, especially a, maybe a novelist, but you, you were previously worked at Geico, uh, the, you know, the insurance company, as a data analyst. So w- were there any kind of transferable skills there from being a data analyst to, to what you make your living from today as an author? Yeah, actually, that that's an excellent point that you bring up. What's interesting about data analytics is that it trains one's mind to constantly be asking the question, what if? So when it comes to marketing, I will try something. I'll try a series of ads, maybe some promotions through BookBub. Maybe, like you mentioned earlier, the, uh, you know, trying not just fiction, but going into nonfiction and and branching out. And I'm always asking the question, what if I did it this way or this way? And then the data analyst in me wants to find the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would benefit from sort of that mindset that always be questioning what you're doing and then get a theory, test it and see if you can then find an answer that will allow you to run a more profitable business, if that makes sense. And in, in the world of, of Amazon, especially when it comes to um, marketing and Amazon and, uh, and, and advertising in Amazon, what are the, the, maybe the two or three key um, you know, performance indicators, the key numbers that you as a, as a writer and also as a marketer of your writing is really focused on each day? Well, that, that is, for me, 
it's a bit different than most people that are dipping their toes into Amazon ads in that I'm looking at indicators such as with an ad or series of ads for an individual book, I will look at the daily number of impressions, my clicks for that ad or series of ads, my daily spend. Things like click-through rate are sort of a secondary indicator where I would like my ads to have a good click-through rate, but I'm less concerned with that than I am with the amount of spend per day because ultimately I have my description is pretty well dialed in. I know what my conversion rate is on each of my books, you know, plus or minus. Uh, it used to be one in 20 to 30, and now I've, I'm converting it one in six to one in 10. And by knowing that data and then looking at the spend, I can see what I need to do to try to continue to grow. The biggest battle in Amazon ads for anybody that's just starting out is figuring out how to scale up your spend because while it's really exciting to have 300% return on investment, if the daily investment's only $2, it's not so, such a big deal in the grand scheme of things. And once you've had $2 that is now turning itself into six or $8, you really want to figure out how to turn $100 into you know, $300, $400. And the hard part is getting Amazon to spend the money. And that's why I'm writing the book is to help people to learn how to do that. And, and I, I read another quote from you because um, you came to into writing in 2010 and you, you, you said this, 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 uh, this quote I saw, which is, I'm from the ebook generation. I never really wanted a print book. Um, and that's kind of interesting for me because so, I think so many authors, they think of having that physical printed book, but you came at it from, from a different perspective. So, so what was your thinking there? Yeah, and when I made that quote, and I, I still sort of feel that same way, I spend most of my time and energy focusing on ebook sales, but I, I never had that much interest in doing signings. I didn't care if my book was in a physical location. I have since done signings, and they are really exciting the first few times, but then after about the third or fourth one, I had a period where I was promoting a nonfiction book about the University of Iowa Hawkeyes men's basketball team with the gentleman who I co-wrote the book with, Roy Marble, and him and I did 30 signings in three weekends mm. around central Iowa. And it was we had multiple ones per day. It was an incredible amount of energy and preparation and coordination to make it all happen. And at the end of that three weeks, I think after paying all the expenses and all, I had $300 left over, yeah. I mean, of profit, which, you know, $300, I can make that spending a couple good hours doing Amazon ads from the comfort of my home. And so <laughs> it is in no way to, to, to bash the print book. And in fact, I would say that if I were sort of analyzing my own performance that I've left money on the table because I've not spent enough time with print books. In fact, not all of my books are even out in print. I've got five or six now that have print versions. The ones with Honoré, those we always get out in print because she handles that. I just couldn't be bothered. And you know what? Back in October, when I started putting my books up for print, they started to sell. Hmm. And I've not done anything. I think that there's some ancillary benefit to running the Amazon ads where a person sees an ad and perhaps the book isn't right for them, but they think it would be good for someone they know. Yeah. And it's often easier to give a print book. And so sure enough, the my earlier quote was probably uh, didn't have quite the, the foresight that uh, maybe now looking back, I would say print books are important. I just haven't put much effort into them and then the, let's talk about your own kind of creative process kind of coming away from the the analytical side i mean where where do your your new ideas sure. generally come from or or do they actually come from analysis do they come from looking and seeing what the market wants first and then writing the book or 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 is it a different process where, where do you go for that inspiration for those ideas 
it's interesting that you mentioned right to market. I have not yet written to market, but it is something that I have every intention of giving a try this year. I'm fascinated by the idea of writing to market, and I think that so many people turn their noses up at it without truly understanding what the people who write to market are doing. They're not simply, and I'm making air quotes with my fingers now, selling out. What they're doing is saying, I would like to write about this subject, and with a little bit of research, I can do a better job. And that can be in fiction or nonfiction. And I truly want to test it. I've not done it yet. My ideas right now simply come from the the world building, whether it's the science fiction or the uh, the the, the uh, I have a satire series as well. I have a the Henry Woods series. I've written a couple of young adults, and generally with each series, I will get a kernel of an idea. And when I started out writing initially back in 2010, my first chapter for the Henry Wood Detective Agency was a blog post on January 30th. I didn't have any intention of writing chapter two. My idea was I needed a blog post. I hadn't done anything interesting that day, so I wrote what would be the first chapter of a noir mystery, thinking it was just a fun way to do a blog post. And my readers liked it, so I wrote chapter two. And about nine months later, every time I needed a chapter for the blog, I would put up a new part of the story. And I was a pantster at the time, meaning – that I didn't outline, I didn't figure out, I didn't know who the murderer was until the end end of the story. That's how I wrote my first six novels. Wow. All of them were, I would get a kernel of an idea, and I could never at the time imagine writing 50 to 100,000 words because I remembered in college and those papers when you got a 20-page paper was just a horrible, horrible nightmare to think about. And yet... I can always sit down and write a thousand words. I can bang out a thousand words in 45 minutes, no problem. And so by thinking in terms of tiny little chunks without worrying when the end was going to come, I was able to get to the end of the novels. Now, after having written so many, I'm not afraid of 50,000 words, 100,000 words, whatever it might be. I just write until the story is done. And I've actually changed from being a pantster, somebody that just writes by the seat of their pants, to a plotter, somebody that works out the details ahead of time. And when I did it on my first science fiction book, The Magellan Apocalypse, Map Runners, it was after listening to the Udemy course, watching the Udemy course, Udemy course by Sean Platt about how he writes his beats. Mm. And so I wrote that novel because I wanted to test out his theories – and they worked wonderfully. I ended up writing it in five hours short of a fortnight. Wow! And when you that kind of 2010 period, were you were you still doing the day the day job as well, or at that point, and you just were you just on the on the writing? In 2010, I had a day job where I was working four days a week, and then in 2000, late 2012, I cut it back to two days a week so I could focus on writing. In 2012, I sort of relaunched the Henry Woods series, and so I had five or six books out at that time and knew that I had enough feedback that it was this was something I could pursue. I didn't know when the day would come that I would quit the day job completely, but I knew that given enough novels and enough time that eventually I would get there. And so I just worked towards that. I made just enough to feed myself. And then in October of 2015, I had my first uh, $7,000 month in net profit, which was vastly more than I was making at my two day a week job. And that's when I put in my notice and haven't looked back. Fantastic. And and for, for many of our listeners just now that maybe got the idea for, for that book, but have have their day gig, any any advice on what, kind of doing what you did there, which was kind of starting having some kind of uh, ritual uh, routine for, for writing and then gradually, sure. you know, moving out. So you full time. So when you that kind of 2010 period, when you, you were working those four days a week, how were you structuring your writing? When were you writing? Well, I'm more of a night person. Honoré, which ironically 
she, you know, she's been on your show and she manages the Miracle Morning brand for Hal Elrod. She's a morning person. I like to write at night. Back in 2010, and actually still now, I most often write in the evenings. So I got in this habit with the blog post, or with the blog of writing a post every night, sometime between 10 in the evening and midnight. And I did it every night, and I did it for years and years and years. And my life, no matter what I was doing, the the one thing that I would never cheat on was getting that blog post up. It was it was important to me. It was something I enjoyed. And even if I was sick or doing stuff with friends, if I knew I was going to be going out with friends, I might write it earlier in the day. But I made sure that the post was always there to go up because for me, and I'm sure there's other listeners out there, there was something about having that consecutive day streak of, you know, first it was 10 days in a row, then it was 30, then it was five years in a row of not missing. And so it became important. And because of that, I produced, uh, I produced a lot of novels. I finished the fourth Henry Wood novel before I published the first one. And it was just the habit of doing that every day. I actually am not as good about my writing now that I've gotten away from the blocking. And when I am writing every day, my productivity is, is amazing. But you know, every, everyone stumbles and, uh, me, I've slid back a little bit on not producing as much words, focusing more on the advertising. And you mentioned there on the, the, the blog post doing those kind of evening, uh, blog posts. So what, what role yep. did the blog have? Because you're, you're writing a novel. So were you, were you testing ideas out in the blog or were you actually writing full chapters and putting them up on the blog and then they would eventually become a book? What, what, what role, role did the, uh, the blog play? Well, initially the blog was about woodworking. My readers were woodworkers and it had all come about because on January 2nd, I was bored. I went to blogger. I was just surfing around the web and I found blogger.com. And the day before I had written a, or not written, I had done some woodworking. I was trying to build my first woodworking bench and there's an old adage. It says measure twice, cut once. Everybody knows that saying. And the issue was that on January 1st, I was measuring twice and later only cut once, but I was doing the measuring while watching college football. And that's where the problem came in, in that on January 2nd, when I stood my legs up to move on to the next part of building the bench, I realized I had four legs of three different lengths and only one of the four was actually correct. And I thought that was funny. So I I wrote this silly blog post about it. And then when I was done, I found this forum and you had mentioned that at the beginning of the show, it was a woodworking forum called Lumberjocks. And I went there and I was looking around. There was all these amazing, incredibly talented people, people making, you know, reproduction, Georgian furniture and just these incredible things. And I was just trying to figure out how to make a box So I was reading through all their posts, and I decided, well, it was a pretty neat place. I better sign up or I'll lose it never find it again. I did, and as soon as I hit the confirmation button, a a new button appeared, and it said blog. Well, I had already blogged, so I went back and copy and pasted the post I'd written on blogger.com and put it into Lumberjocks. And the next day, like you had mentioned, I went back. There were 300 people that had seen it, 25 people had left comments, and they were all glowing and positive, and people wanted me to write more, and that was the day I started blogging. And so my blog posts every day were relating to my journey in woodworking, and it was only when, for whatever reason, I had a day without woodworking that I would continue writing the fiction as a way to keep the streak alive. Mm. And it wasn't until September when I actually wrote the end on my first novel that my perception began to change because no sooner had I put up that post than my readers were like, this is great. I can't wait for you to start book two. And I was like, book two, what are you kidding me? You're, you're all ready for book two. But sure enough, I continued on with book two and the blog itself Again, most of the posts were unrelated to the writing. It was maybe a year before it sort of morphed into I was writing posts more often than not. 
that were chapters in the book. The one thing that I would tell people that would be upsetting to those who are very meticulous is that I put the posts up without any editing, often without even rereading it. And so my readers were getting an absolute first draft and there would be spelling errors, uh, punctuation problems, but ultimately I didn't care and they didn't care. And so I was able to just get it up and that getting those posts online allowed me to get some readers. And then you asked about the process. Well, it wasn't very long. I think it was after the four Henry Woods when I did my first satire or no, it was my first thriller where the people leaving comments about the story as it were, was going, people were trying to guess what was going to happen. Well, at the time I was a panster. I, I didn't have any more clue as to what was going to happen next than any of the, the readers their feedback started to inform my writing and actually change the direction of the story because there were people that were making guesses that were really good. And I would say, you know, that's a great idea. And then I would head off in that direction. Mm. And so I sort of let the readers help guide me along, which I think uh, led to a better story. And Is in it- fact, one, one reader, if I, if I may, there was one reader after I finished the thriller who sent me a, a tweet and he, he asked me, he said, I love the thriller, but I've got to ask, why haven't you written any satire? Because I used to do guest posts on a number of blogs and my guest posts were always funny, snarky. The goal was to get people to laugh because I figured if somebody was asking me to be a guest blogger, I should try to entertain. And I told him, I don't know. What do you think I should write about? And we had a Twitter discussion and that day I started – Underwood Scotch and Rye, which is my best-selling book of all of my books, is the satire. And it was all because one reader said I should. So I did. And it's that that process you're just talking about there, that, I mean, there's a little bit of kind of almost kind of co-creation there. Uh, It's not dissimilar. We had Amanda Palmer uh, on the show a while back, and um, she was talking about, she calls it second screen songwriting where she'll be literally working on a song and she's going out to her Twitter followers and saying, you know, what's another way to express this? Or, you know, when you think of X, what what comes to your mind? Very nice. And then she would be pulling, pulling that into the, into the book. Now I'm not sure her, her, um, her partner, Neil Gaiman, whether he uses that (laughs) same technique or not, but, but I I think that's quite an interesting. And so the, the, I guess the way that you could do that is, both I know both yourself and and Honore, you're big proponents of self publishing. Um, and I know Honore writes a lot about the kind of self publishing side of things as well. D- did you did you always Absolutely. kind of go into it with thinking, okay, I want to self publish, um, as opposed to like going through the thing of finding a book agent and a you know literary agent and finding a publisher and all that side? Did did you kind of know right from the start that that's the, the self publishing route was the one for you? Yes, absolutely, hundred percent from the start. This goes back to me being a data analyst, I looked at 70 cents on the dollar, which is what we get from Kindle sales of any book priced over $2.99. And I compared that with 12 and a half to 15%. If you are lucky enough to get a traditional contract and you have to give a portion of that up to your agent and both the agent and the traditional publisher expect you to do all of the marketing. And so I didn't see any upside to the traditional publishing. Now, that being said, there are authors out there that are stressed out about the whole entrepreneurial aspect of running every piece of your business from having an editing team and managing them to various cover artists. If you do multiple genres, you'll need different artists to managing the the ads and they're not as concerned about how much they're going to make from their book they just kind of want to get it published and get it up and move move on with their life but for me again i was living below the poverty line i really was interested in how can i feed myself and there's just so much more money in doing the work yourself again I I mean, I don't do the editing myself. I'm not an artist. So I hire the people that need to do those aspects, but I'm in control of it. And then at the end of the day, I get to keep all the revenue. So that's 
I never really looked at the traditional side. And again, I don't begrudge anyone that goes that route. There are certainly good reasons. But if you're in it to make a living, I can't imagine you would choose traditional. And now that you're at a stage where you've had, you know, three fiction books, 13 novels, you know, these series that you, you've had, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you'd be very, very attractive to uh, to publishers and you've been you know, approached by publishers as, as well. Um, so when those those inevitable uh, calls do come in or those emails do come in, um, what what's your take on them? Is it always, like a, you know, thank you, but <laughs> no thank you? Or is it uh, is it a bit more nuanced? Well, than that? Yeah, I mean, I. I, well, no, it, it is. I just, I want to be, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I don't want to tell them that I think that they're managing their publishing poorly. I just, I don't believe that the the big five in New York or, you know, the medium-sized publishers, I don't believe they've really kept up with the current state of the book market. I was talking to a gentleman well, talking, I was chatting with him on Facebook three days ago, and he knows a lot about traditional publishing. And the one question I've always had is how many data analysts do the large publishing houses employ to make their marketing decisions? And he mentioned one, and I, I won't give names, but he said they had, they had just recently added data analysts to their mix. And he said a lot of them maybe have one or two or none. And that to me says they're not really managing their businesses correctly. If you don't know where your revenue is coming from or test different marketing ideas, if there's nobody doing the behind the scenes math, if you're just publishing you know, a, a hundred books a year or a thousand books a year, and then hoping that one of them turns out to be Harry Potter, it's not a great strategy. And I look at the the descriptions across Amazon. That's something I've been working a lot on the last four or five months, the art of copywriting, which is entirely different than writing prose. Copywriting is hard. And when I learned how to properly do copywriting and I changed the descriptions on my books, on the Amazon pages, the conversion improved instantly. It was the next day revenue went up. And I did a back of the envelope calculation. I estimated, because I did this back in September and October, I estimated that had I done those same changes 12 months earlier, I would have had about $60,000 more in revenue. Now, I'm not crying over that $60,000. I'm thrilled that I made the decision to do it last September as opposed to September of 2022. But now that I kind of have an understanding of how copywriting works and how you get a person through your description to the end and then with the call to action, get them to try your book. And I look at traditional descriptions they're not written by copywriters. Yeah. They're ju- they're just not. And I, I and I've looked at I went through a dozen of my favorite books of all time. And there wasn't one of them that had a description that probably converts it better than one in 30. And you take that across an entire book of business at, uh, you know, one of the, the traditional five publishers and a book like, you know, Pulitzer prize winning the goldfinch. They're selling huge piles of those books, but they could be converting instead of at one at 30 to you know, one in six, and nobody there has done any data analysis to figure out how they can improve their business. The book is either making a pile of money or it isn't, and they don't ask the question on the successful ones, are we leaving money on the table? And so I, I would accept a position as CEO of one of the <laughs> traditional publishers, but I'm not, I wouldn't let them publish my book unless I was a majority shareholder. It, it reminds me a little bit, having come from the music industry as well, I can see a lot of parallels was what was happening with the, with the, the publishing and the way the publishing. And, and now, actually, to the music industry's credit, they, they are waking up and a lot of the, 
the uh, the, the the more forward thinking uh, companies they ha- exactly as you said they're thinking more like startups and they're thinking more and they're entrepreneurial and they're bringing in an, they have yes. analysts as part of their team as part of their marketing team as well. Um, so that obviously the the analysts was a big insight. The number of insights you had here. Other was there any other kind of key insights? Uh, maybe from the more from the the creative side and less from the marketing side where you kind of made a distinction. You you were doing the, the the work you were doing. You went oh maybe this is this is the direction I want to be going with my writing. Um, what, can you talk about any of those those kind of light bulb moments? Oh, I had I had a great light bulb moment. Moment. There's an author, a U- U.S. author. Well, he, he just passed away I think a couple of years ago, but his name's Elmore Leonard. Oh yeah. And over his lifetime, I believe he wrote. At one point, it was 44 novels. He may have written one or two more before he passed away. I've read 17 of them. There are those that think that Elmore Leonard is the greatest American writer of dialogue in the last century. And for those who don't know Elmore Leonard, a lot of his books have been turned into movies. Uh, Get Shorty is based on yeah. one of his books. L.A. Confidential, I think um, was that one of his? L.A. Confidential is one. The There's a show called uh, – TV show called Justified that is based on sort of two of his books, the main character in two of his books. And – that moment that you, you talked about, the light bulb moment for me, I was on my maybe 10th Elmore Leonard novel. And as Stephen King says in On Writing, if you don't have time to read, you don't have time to be an author because it is important to read because you get ideas. And I hadn't gotten any ideas the first nine novels, but then on the 10th one, I'm reading the dialogue and these two characters are going back and forth and they're having two different conversations. It's, it is apparent that neither one is listening to what the other person is saying. And that was such a eureka moment because that's how we talk. How many times have we been talking with our spouse or girlfriend or you know, significant other and say, oh, what do you think of this shirt? Does, does, it, does it go with the belt? Oh, I didn't remember to get the oil changed. And <laughs> – he, he doesn't overdo it, but those little bits of disconnect where two people are obviously lost in their own thoughts was incredibly powerful to me. Now, it's not something that I do – you don't want to do that throughout all the dialogue, but once or twice in any given novel, I'll try to work in a moment like that because it really rings to the way people talk back and forth. And so – once I had that eureka moment, then with every bit of dialogue that I read of his, I my, my level of focus was intense because he really, truly knows how to make the characters interact in such a way that draws you in. So it was almost like those imperfections added to the depth of the characters. That's exactly right. And and what's I mentioned? You mentioned your kind of writing habits, you know, in the early days of doing those evening um, writing sessions. Were were there is there any kind of habits as a writer you think contributes to your your success as as a self published writer? Any things you, you continue to do today that you say, you know, if, if if I wasn't doing that thing, I don't think I'd be as a successful writer as I am today. Well, there's there's one thing that I I do a fair amount of, and I actually because I love data. I know that that's kind of a, a recurring theme here, but I was curious one time because I went out and I like writing in public. There's something about being in a cafe or a diner or a bar and I have an iPad with a Bluetooth keyboard and I opened it up and one day, this was a couple years ago, I had a great writing session. I was in this cafe. It was packed. There were I mean, every table was taken. It was incredibly loud. It was a football Saturday in Iowa City. And so people were with their families and fired up for for the game. And I got into a zone where I tuned all of them out and wrote a couple thousand words in in a really short time. And I was – when I got done and I looked at the word count, I was shocked by the productivity considering all the chaos around me. And so – at the, at the beginning of the podcast, I mentioned that I'm always asking questions, you know, why, what if? And so I started keeping a little Excel spreadsheet and I would go out and I would time the length of time of my writing session. I would put it in the Excel spreadsheet and I would put the word count. And I compared my productivity in public 
versus at home where it's completely quiet and I can turn things off, but I can also turn on the Xbox. I mean, there's just, there's things that, you know, go to the refrigerator, those distractors that just keep my mind from being laser focused. And it didn't take very long at all for me to realize that I write about 20% faster in a noisy public environment. And so though I don't always write in public, I, I do a lot. And that, that absolutely changed the level of productivity. And I don't know that it would is something that is advice I'd pass on to anyone else. But I would say, give it a try. Yeah. Track your results. Because I get 20% is you know, a big deal over the course of a year. It's interesting. In fact, I was I was speaking at a conference recently, and I mentioned something along those lines. In fact, there's a, there's a wonderful app if people haven't checked out called Co- uh, Coffitivity, which plays the noise uh, of a coffee shop in the background when you're at home, <laughs> when you're in a home office, um, because there's actually increasing studies done now about that kind of low level noise. I don't know how many decibels that is, like sixty decibels or some, something in, in that range, probably. Um, that that's interesting that helps with uh with the creative process as well and and obviously there's a long history of writers writing in and i think Heming, hemingway was probably the most famous because he had his three ca- he always said every writer needs to have three cafes the cafe that they uh they write in they work in the cafe that they eat in and yep. then the cafe that they socialize in and they should not be the same places <laughs> he said because the worst thing is when you get into that oh, flow no, as a writer that you, is brilliant you, you want to be in a different place than maybe the one where you're going to be socializing so so there you go so hopefully a uh, listener if you've got you thinking okay I'm, I'm need to be heading out to that coffee shop to be there writing and actually it, it's not such a strange thing this the, the ancient greeks and the romans uh, believed in this very much they called it the the genius loci that actually places have their own genius and sometimes you know, coffee shops they can have the, just the place well, that environment can have their own genius so um let's talk about tools you, you mentioned you know we're talking about amazon the ad network and everything there as well do, do you have any online resources or tools sure. or apps like evernote for example that, that you love i have a tool that I use, as I said, I write everything on my iPad. I and the reason is the Bluetooth keyboard I have. It's a half-stroke key, and for whatever reason, of all the keyboards, and I, I'm a I'm a tech nerd. I, I love buying technology. I have you know two laptops, an Apple one, and a PC. I've got a huge desktop at home. I've I've just got all sorts of technology. Of all the keyboards that I have. The one that I use on the iPad, just I, the, the words flow on. I love that keyboard. And so I write everything on the iPad. I use a an app called Storyist to do all of my writing. It allows me – there's character sheets. There's places for putting in scene descriptions. And all of that is kept very nicely off to the side and you can just go in and – if you're trying to remember what was the color of the car that you gave the character 13 chapters ago, I have those details and it's very easy for me to access them. That being said, there's the tool that I publish with and a lot of self-published authors use is called Scrivener. Scrivener yeah, is tool. absolutely fantastic. It, it's $40. You can buy it on Amazon. I, I recommend learning how to use it even if you end up hiring someone to do your layout and creating your, your Mobi files. If you have a rudimentary understanding of Scrivener and an author, or an author, a reader leaves a comment that the book was great, five stars, but twice they had the word the, the. Well, that's something you want to fix. And you don't want to necessarily wait for your person that does the layout to do it. You just want to be able to go into the file, fix it, compile, upload, and be done with it. So I love Scrivener, and I understand that Scrivener now has an iPad app, which I've not tested out. So I guess before anybody goes out and buys Storyist, I would buy the Scrivener copy for your computer and then test out that app and see how it compares. The only reason I haven't gone to that app is that you know, I've got about seven novels with all of the notes and everything in Storyist, and I, I just don't want to try to spend the effort to try something new, if it, that makes and sense. And it's, it's great. I've actually tried the uh, the Scrivener uh, uh, 
uh, iPad app recently, um, and, and I've started using it. And it's actually it's, oh, it's very was it? good. It was because that was one of the criticisms I always had for Scriven is I could never use it on my i um, on my iPad, and it's great. Um, I, I really like how it works, and also I use it more for. I mean, I use Scrivener for when I'm putting my talks, my keynotes together. I actually use it as for that. My wife uses it for um, oh, for screenwriting. Um, so it has multiple uses. But what's very nice, and I, I speak to a lot of writers, they, they love the 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 um, the corkboard element to it, where you have where you can actually just map out how your story is going to kind of flow and, and things. So it's a great tool. So we'll definitely put this on. People go to jamestaylor.me um, and just look for Brian Meeks and you're in the show notes. Well, I'll put the links to all these as well, both the iPad and the and the, the regular version as well. So um, that's it on the kind of resources side. If you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners, what would they be? What well, the record one, I, I grew up liking The Who, The Rolling Stones, The Kinks. So, I mean, I live in the 70s. That, that's sort of my music. Led Zeppelin, I mean, there, there, there's lots of ones. But what's interesting is I've recently discovered that Baroque music is – there's something about Baroque music that allows the brain to focus. And for about the last – Four months, I have done all of my writing while listening to Baroque. And it is incredible how laser focused I get with the Baroque music on. And so, well, I don't necessarily have a specific album. There are, I will go on to YouTube. There's YouTube videos with nine hours of Baroque music. That's what I listen to. And so, I recommend anyone trying Baroque. It is it's amazing what it does to your productivity. As for a book, my favorite book probably that I've read in the last couple years would be Remde, R-E-A-M-D-E by Neil Stevenson, who most people know him for having written a book called Snow Crash. And Remde is a giant tome. I absolutely loved it. So if I had to pick one book, it would be Remedy by Neil Stevenson. Wonderful. We'll put these all in the show notes as well. So final question for you, Brian. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of your trade, your Scrivener, your your uh, your iPad, okay. your, your keyboard, and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you. Uh, you have no contacts in, in the industry. How would you restart? Oh, that, that's a good question. I would the first thing I would do, and perhaps my biggest regret over this time, is that early on I didn't understand what authors meant when they said their list. I didn't realize there was a difference between people who subscribe to your blog and people that have signed up to get your newsletter, and and that was I put off dealing with that for years. And so the first thing I would do is I would get a Mailchimp account. I would get that set up and then I would probably set up a blog just because that was a great way to begin to try to find some readers out of the gate. And then I would write probably three or four books without doing anything else because if I was like you described, if I woke up tomorrow and all of it was gone but I still had the knowledge, that would mean I wouldn't spend the hours each day managing my ads, all of the details of my life that revolve around managing the book business would be gone. So I could sit down and I would imagine I could write three or four novels in three or four months. And I have no doubt that I could get back to where I am probably twice as quickly as I did, you know, the first go around just because the learning curve would, would not exist. Well, it's been a, Brian, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today and, and for you kind of sharing your knowledge. And I'm Thank sure that a lot of our authors are going to be fascinated by picking up some of these books. Obviously, you've got the, the Prosperous Writer's Guide to Making uh, More Money, one of the recent ones with Honoré. You have your, your one that's coming up soon, the Amazon ad. So we'll, we'll be sure to kind of add that to the show notes when, when that, that book comes out as well. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian. What's the best way for people to uh, connect with you, to, to, to find out all your books and to, to kind of stay in touch? Well, probably the easiest way to find me is just look for my name, Brian Meeks, on Amazon or 
my pen name, Arthur Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, which four of my books, the science fiction and killing Hemingway are under Arthur Byrne. Reach out to me on Facebook. I love chatting with people. Um, just Brian Meeks on Facebook. And uh, like you mentioned uh, earlier, the the Facebook group, if somebody is interested in learning about Amazon ads, has one caveat. And that's the group is Mastering Amazon Ads and Author's Guide. But the caveat is everybody that is in the group has agreed that for getting all this information about the Amazon ads ahead of time, they will in fact buy a copy when the pre-order goes up and it'll be at $9.99. So if nice. anybody out there is willing to invest $9.99, then they are welcome to be a part of the group and we will teach them how to do Amazon ads to grow their business. Fantastic. Well, thank Brian, thanks so much for coming on the show. I wish you all the best with this new book and, and all the f- many future books that you're going to be publishing as well. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.